My name is Katerina. I am the Refuge Volunteer and Programs Coordinator uh, from North Carolina Wildlife Federation. I work out of the Pocosin Lakes Headquarter Building. Um, and today we are doing our next installment of the Winter in the Refuges seminar series. Uh, today we'll be talking about Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge. Um, and today to talk about Alligator National Wildlife Refuge um, is Stephen Warner. He's the Education Programs Coordinator out of that region. He um, works specifically with Alligator River and Pea Island National Wildlife Refuge. So um, he will be doing Alligator River this week, and then next week he'll be doing Pea Island as well. Uh, so without further wait, I'll pass it on to Stephen. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, again, my name is Steve Warner. Um, I am the Education Programs Coordinator for Alligator River and Pea Island National Wildlife Refuges. And we're going to be talking just about the Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge today and what goes on during the winter. But first, we're going to talk about what is the purpose of the National Wildlife River at Alligator River. Well, this is right off our website. It's to protect and preserve unique wetland habitat types and associated wildlife species. Provide habitat and protection for endangered species such as red wolves, red cockaded woodpeckers and American alligators. Provide habitat for black bears, pro provide habitat and management for waterfowl and other migratory birds. And that's primarily what we do in the wintertime. Um, we also provide for a wide variety of native, native species through diverse wildlife management techniques and strategies. And lastly, we provide wildlife dependent public opportunities, including hunting, fishing, wildlife interpretation, observation, photography, and environmental education. First thing I want to cover is where is Alligator River and how big is it? Kind of a description of it. Uh, well, it's it's on the east coast of North Carolina near the Outer Banks. It's about 20 miles to the west of Nags Head, North Carolina Beach on Route 64. Uh, so if you're coming from central North Carolina and coming down Route 64 to get to the Outer Banks, you'll hit Alligator River uh, about 20 miles before you get to the beach. If you Google Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge, it will put you in the middle of the refuge. Uh, the middle of the refuge has horrible roads. They're dirt roads. They're slippery and slimy and not maintained very well. It's not a good place to be. If you want to search for Alligator River and get to the best place to start, search for Milltail Road in Manteo, North Carolina. That's the best place to start. There's a kiosk there that has maps, which is very important because we have a lot of dirt roads. So you need to know where you're going on the refuge. And um, yeah, start there. There's a kiosk with maps. There's a trail there. Uh, yeah, it's a good place to start. Uh, as for size, it is really big. Uh, it's 156,000 acres, uh, roughly 20 miles from north to south and 12 miles from east to west. Uh, it is so large it actually has a military bombing range uh, that's right in the middle of it. The military bombing range is used by the uh, Air Force and Navy now and it was there be long before the refuge uh, was established. Um, they used to use live bombs. Uh, they don't use those anymore. They haven't in a long time. They use laser technology for their bombing practice. Uh, however, uh, when they are doing their practice, you will have military uh, jets flying very low over the refuge. And it can be a little scary sometimes because they, they are very loud and they fly very low. So if you ever come out there and you hear the jets flying, be prepared for a a jet to come screaming over your head at about uh, 200 feet above your head. It's kind of scary. Uh, Alligator River is also a major point on the Atlantic Flyway. That's a migratory bird uh, flyway. And that's um, that's one of the reasons why we're here. So here is a uh, I just grabbed this from Google Maps to show you where it is. Uh, on the right side there, you see the uh, the Outer Banks, Jeanette's Pier, that's in Nags Head, uh, out at the beach. And you go uh, 15, 20 miles uh, to the westward and you run into Milltail Road. And as I said, that is one of the best places to start if you're gonna come and visit Alligator River. 
So next up, I've got the Atlantic Flyway map, and this is just a representative uh, map of, of some of migratory birds. Uh, you can see the 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 uh, congregation or the the paths all kind of meet right above eastern North Carolina there, and that's right above where uh, Alligator River is. So a lot of birds uh, use the this flyway and either pass through Alligator River in eastern North Carolina, or they actually stop here. Um, the refuge uh, has has a, a lot of waterfowl, shorebirds, wading birds, migratory songbirds. Uh, it's it's a major stopping point for some birds, uh, just just for a rest, and some of them stay all winter long. Now, December uh, through February is also an exciting time on the refuge. Uh, we get uh, thousands of winged teal, mallards, American widgeons, black ducks, pintails shovelers, tundra swans, all kinds of birds. There's hundreds of birds that come in in the winter time. It's a great time to see uh, see birds. If you're a birder, it's a, it's a wonderful time to be here. I'm just going to show you just, just a very few birds uh, that do stop here. Um, one is the American coot. We also have Tundra swans. I did a uh, talk on tundra swans a couple weeks ago. Swans are here by the by the hundreds. Uh, they're wonderful birds, uh, majestic to see in flight, and very loud and noisy on the ground. Uh, but they're they're one of our our uh, winter guests that stay here uh, for a couple months. We also have merlins that will come and stay for the winter time. Uh, next up is buffle headed ducks and like I said, this is just a small spattering of the uh, birds that you can see if you come down to Alligator River. Uh, you can see many, many different uh, types of ducks, migratory birds, songbirds, things like that. So what do we do for these birds uh, to get them to come here? Well, most of what we do is called habitat management. And most of the habitat we manage is, is farmer's fields, and we manage it with water. Um, we manage the, the crop fields from farmers. They, they plant their crops, uh, and we, we flood them with water in the wintertime. As you can see on the left, there's a crop field. Uh, right in the middle of it is a wild turkey. Um, and then the right side is a similar field, and you can see some of the crop has been left there and the field is flooded, providing habitat. Now that provides uh, uh, grain management, uh, grain for forage for the birds. We ask the, the farmers to leave a certain percentage of their crop in the fields as forage for, for the birds. Um, water management, we've got a lot of fields out there that we flood. So we have two extremely large pump houses. Each pump house has three very, very large pumps in it and they flood to um, uh, our main canals. Then we have a series of uh, extremely heavy duty portable pumps um, that we use and these go ahead and flood the fields and we'll use them to maintain the water level in the fields. We'll do this slowly so that uh, we don't create any erosion or anything like that in the fields. Then when springtime comes, after all the migratory birds have, have uh, gone north again, we go ahead and we drain these fields. But when we drain them, we use the same pumps, but we drain them very, very slowly. Um, we want to leave as much of the nutrients and microbes and things that are in the water, we want to leave that in the fields for the farmers uh, and for the birds next year. Okay, so when when uh, the migratory birds start arriving uh, here at the Outer Banks and Alligator River, uh, we have our biggest event of the year. It's called Wings Over Water Festival. Um, this is a, a birding festival. It is a huge deal. It began in 1997 uh, just as a way to encourage people and offer the public wildlife and wildland interpretation, educational opportunities and experiences on the local refuges. Um, it's a fundraising event for us, and it's grown from just a few uh, activities in 1997 uh, to over 90 birding, paddling, photography, art, natural history programs now. Uh, activities play, take place all throughout the eastern North Carolina from Mackey Island National Wildlife, which is right on the border with Virginia, all the way down to Ocracoke Island. We've got some events down there and all the way to the west uh, to Pocosin uh, Lakes 
uh, National Wildlife Refuge, which is about 60 miles inland uh, from the beach. So it's we these these activities take place uh, in a wide area. Um, Next, I'll show you uh, just briefly our schedule for this coming year, which is still very tentative right now because of uh, COVID restrictions. And we're not sure if this is going to go off, but we're going to plan on having it as best we can um, until we hear definitely that we can't. So it's going to be in October from the 19th to the 24th. As I said, the events take place from Mackey Island in the north to Ocracoke Island. Most of them are uh, right around the Outer Banks and um, Alligator River and Pea Island. Uh, well, there's activities from birding 101 to wildlife art and photography classes, uh, kayak paddling uh, sessions, tours. Uh, there's sunrise tours, evening tours, sunset tours. There's, uh, I think, 11 uh, scheduled kayak tours that we had on last year's schedule. Birding opportunities from beginners to experts. We've had we have some expert um, uh, tours that take you out with, with an expert uh, guide and people have found as many as a hundred different birds on in one day on one of these expert tours. So they're wonderful and it just shows how many birds are actually out there. Um, we also have a keynote speaker on the Saturday night. Uh, these keynote speakers, many of them are birders. Last year was somebody who was going to speak on, on black bears. Uh, so it may not be a, a birding speaker and it's always interesting and it's really well attended. Uh, as I said, this is just a small spattering of what's uh, offered at our Wings Over Water Festival. If you wanna find out uh, what goes on and how to sign up for things, go to wingsoverwater.org uh, and you can go to the schedule and you can see all of the uh, events that were scheduled for last year that uh, unfortunately was postponed due to COVID. Uh, but that is what we are planning to do again this year if we don't have any COVID restrictions. Now, the, the main uh, Wings Over Water event is in October. Uh, but many of our migratory birds still haven't arrived yet. So we do an encore session of Wings Over Water in December, and this year it's going to be December 10th through the 12th. Now that is December, so it can be very cold out here, very windy. So if you are planning to come down, you're going to need to bundle up. You're going to need to wear some uh, some boots because uh, the water out there, we're going to take it all. All the tours are going to be mostly walking tours and you may be walking through some flooded fields or things like that. Uh, the Wings Over Water Encore event, we actually uh, get get you into areas that are normally closed because you're being escorted by someone from the refuge. So you're going to get to see areas that are not normally seen by regular folks. And as I said, in December, almost all of the migratory birds that are coming are actually here, so you'll get a chance to see more of the wintering birds. Again, go to uh, wingsoverwater.org and you'll be able to see uh, exactly what it is that happens uh, during the encore and the regular festival. So in the wintertime, uh, our our year round uh, animals, they, they don't usually leave. Some of them stay there. So what do they do? Uh, here I see a picture of a river otter and they become much more active in the winter actually. Uh, all summer long, I only saw one individual river otter. And since December, I've seen about four different groups uh, with a minimum of three otters. Uh, every time I've been out on the refuge, I, I seem to always see a river otter. So they get much more active. We have a lot of black bears on Alligator River. We have a lot of black bears on Alligator River. Um, and they're still there. They don't go away. They don't hibernate. It doesn't get cold enough for them to hibernate. Uh, however, the females give birth in January and February. So uh, right around the midwinter time there, they are, they're, they're going in their dens and they're giving birth and they're kind of hanging out. They will come out uh, occasionally, uh, maybe to grab something to eat and and then go back into the den. The males uh, are out and about, but they also are very, very sluggish. You can see in this picture here, this guy's all wet uh, because most of our canals are flooded. Many of the areas that they usually go in the summertime that were dry 
are now flooded because we're managing the uh, the crops and things like that, the, the crop fields for the waterfowl. So there's additional water. So um, the black bears uh, may have to go a lot through water um, to get their food. The next picture is uh, a bear sow and her cubs. And uh, they usually start coming out of their den in early April, by mid-April and late April, certainly. Uh, most of the, the young are out and about, and it's a great time to be out on the refuge. You can see lots and lots of bears if you ever come out here uh, during the springtime. It's a great time to be uh, on Alligator River. And our namesake, our alligators, they, uh, they don't go away either, uh, but they also become very, very sluggish. They usually just kind of hang out in the water and um, they have to breathe. They have to keep breathing. So they, they come up to the surface pretty much. Uh, when water starts to get near 40 degrees, uh, they may go into something called brumation which is similar, but not the same as hibernation. Um, when water temps get near 40 degrees, they, they get very sluggish and they slow down their metabolism and they'll go into a lethargic state. They often go down to the bottom of the, a, a water body, the river or wherever they are, and they may burrow into the mud to, to try and keep warm, only surfacing just to take a breath of air. Uh, differences between hibernation and brumation, uh, they're both periods of dormancy uh, where physiological processes slow down uh, responding to cold temperatures. However, during hibernation, mammals actually fall into a deep sleep. They don't eat, they don't drink, they just kind of sleep. Uh, during brumation, though, reptiles, they don't fall into a sleep. They still have periods of activity. Uh, they don't eat, but they do continue to drink to avoid dehydration. Next, I'm going to talk to you about uh, endangered species. We have uh, several endangered species uh, on the refuge. Uh, one of them is pictured here. It's a red cockaded woodpecker. Uh, I have not seen one of these. I've seen many woodpeckers. I think I've seen four different species on the refuge, but this one is kind of elusive and I haven't seen it yet, but it is here. It's kind of the northern part of their range, but they are here uh, as our guests. We also have um, a wet red wolves. Uh, our red wolf program uh, was was a very big success at first, uh, but it's been beset by declining numbers uh, for a couple of reasons. Predation uh, by hunters who confuse them for coyotes, uh, interbreeding with coyotes, and unfortunately, many of them have simply just been hit by cars. Um, so we're trying to get our program up and get up again and get these numbers. Uh, back up to where they were several years ago, uh, but they are an en endangered species and they are still here, but they are very elusive, very difficult to see. Something that surprised me is that the American alligator, which is the common alligator you see here on Alligator River, uh, is actually uh, a, a threatened species. It's not that their populations are, uh, are threatened or endangered. They have stable populations. In fact, they're actually increasing, um, but they are threatened uh, by something due to similarity of appearance with the American crocodile, which is an endangered species. And unfortunately, many people can't tell the difference between the two. So um, in places where the American crocodile uh, is also present, the American alligator gets the same uh, protections as the crocodile, even though they are not, they themselves are not threatened or endangered. Okay, so where, where do you go to go to see all these animals? We have um, what's called our wildlife drive. It's a, a, a series of roads and loops uh, where you can see black bear, wild turkey, uh, all kinds of birds of prey, waterfowl in the wintertime. Uh, other wild may, wildlife can be seen there. There's a chance to see a wolf even. Um, there's a series of roads. It's about 15 miles. Uh, there's many additional roads on the, on the refuge. Uh, however, we urge you to use caution if you ever take any of these other roads that are not 
clearly marked and covered in gravel. These dirt roads um, are not maintained, uh, especially in the summertime after rains and things like that. If you go down some of these roads, they get very slippery. And as I said, they're not maintained. And uh, we just urge you to use common sense. If a road looks like your, your car or your uh, SUV may not be able to make it through, please turn around and go back because people have gotten their stuck overnight. Um, and it's and it's not comfortable for them. We do offer guided tram tours weekly in the summer uh, and monthly throughout the rest of the year. So that's another way you can get to see um, some of the wildlife. So what are some of the challenges to our wildlife refuge here at Alligator River? Well, one of the biggest challenges we face is rising sea level and saltwater intrusion. Even though uh, it is 20 miles um, from from the coast. Uh, the, the, the sea level rising is pushing salt water into the sounds and um, it's causing problems. Uh, some of the trees uh, can't handle the salt water intrusion. Some of them just can't handle the extra water that's there and it's creating something called ghost forests. And you can see a picture of it here. This is trees that are simply dying right where they're standing and um, it's, it's, it's becoming a problem. It is a, it is a challenge for us. Uh, we try we we try and do some things to mitigate it, but uh, yeah, really it's 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 try, like trying to hold back to see. It's a very difficult situation. Another one of our big challenges is and something we have to manage uh, all the time is wildfires. Uh, the biggest way we manage wildfires uh, is to do prescribed burns. Um, wetland habitats um, in the east coast of North Carolina have a lot of variations. Um, but fire is, is a natural part of many wetland habitats and many of the wetland species actually depend on fire as a part of their life cycles. Uh, some plants need it. Um, the, the, the woodpecker that we talked about earlier needs fire to clear out the space underneath its nests and things. So fire is an important thing. Um, unfortunately, we don't want to have wildfires, uncontrolled fires. So what we do is we do prescribed burns. That helps us to reduce the threat of wildfire to private property because we, we control how much fire is going on. Uh, it limits smoke impacts to local communities. We try and do it when wind is blowing away from communities, not towards them, and keep the fires as small as possible. And it also improves the wildlife habitat. Um, you see there at the bottom, I put uh, that peat can burn. Uh, peat is just a buildup of uh, vegetation that has been packed down over years and years and years. Uh, in some places, it can be as much as 20 feet thick. And if and if a fire ever gets down inside into that peat, uh, it can burn for months and months and months. And it's and it's a very ugly uh, burning fire. It creates a lot of smoke and it's extremely difficult to put out once it starts burning. Even flooding fields sometimes doesn't put it out. Uh, once you once the water goes away, sometimes uh, it didn't put the entire fire out and then it will restart. So uh, prescribed wildfires is an important management technique that we use here to uh, to keep away from actual wildfires, uncontrolled fires. OK, so that was just a brief uh, overview of Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge. Does anybody have any questions for me? Thank you, Stephen. Um, so what we'll do is you can write questions in the chat or you can raise your hand and I can call on you. Um, we do have one question already in the chat, so let me go ahead and ask it. Uh, this is from Bill Willis. He is wondering, what is the source of the water used to flood the farmer's fields? Do the farmers contribute to any expenses or are compensated? Well, the water comes from the uh, the creeks that are naturally there. Um, Milltail Creek, which is actually a very large creek. It's I would consider it a river, but it's called Milltail Creek. Um, and uh, and the Alligator River itself, those are very deep. Um, they're 20, 30 feet deep. There's a lot of water there, so we get the water from there. That's why we have the, the large main pumps that take the water from there and then into large canals, and then the smaller pumps will grab it from there and distribute it into the farmer fields. Now, the farmer's uh, fields 
you taught you asked about that the farmers fields they many of them are left from when before the uh, refuge was actually here they they had the farmers fields there so we work in conjunction with them so they can still use their fields uh, for crops and things uh, but in letting them use continue to use the the crop the fields for their crops uh, we just ask that they use leave a percentage and it depends on what the crop is what the percentage is um, but they go ahead and leave some some of their um, some of their crop behind as forage for for our birds so it's it's always been very very cordial it's very uh, the, the farmers always cooperate with us and we cooperate with them as best we can and it, it's in it's been working out very well for years. OK, and the next question is from Tracy Jeffries and they're asking, are there many hiking trails in the refuge and when is the best time to see wildflowers? There's not a lot of hiking trails. There's two main trails. We have the Creef Cut Trail, which is right near Mill Trail Creek entrance. Um, it's in the parking lot there. It's about three quarters of a mile. It's a boardwalk. It takes you out to um, Sawyer uh, Creek, which is a nice place to view some um, some of the some of the wildlife. Uh, summertime is the best time to go because because uh, there's a lot of wildlife. But if you do go in wintertime, that's OK because you'll see a lot of birds out there. Um, as you go down what's called Buffalo City Road, B Buffalo City Road, at the end of that, there is a kayak or paddling put in. And then there's also a trail right at that same parking lot. And that's another trail to go. That's about a mile out and a mile back. It's not a loop trail, it's the same trail. And that will take you uh, in, into uh, the forested areas. And it's a wonderful trail, great place to see some wildlife. Um, but that's about it. We don't have a lot of trails out there. We, we try to keep the impact of humans uh, to a minimum uh, because we remember we, we we're here for the animals. So we try to keep as, as much of the human contact down as, as best we can. Uh, as for wildflowers, springtime is always a, a good time for, for wildflowers. Um, there's not a lot of wildflowers because most of the vacant fields or uh, non-wooded space is taken up by uh, farmers. So the, the uh, best place to see wildflowers, we have tracts of land actually between the farmers fields and the drainage dishes. And it's usually about 50 feet on either side of the drainage ditch that the farmers don't uh, they don't till it. They don't do anything in it. Uh, it's kind of a filtering area for anything that might be in the farmer's field, any any um, fertilizer or anything that they put in there. And it's a filter so it doesn't get into the water. So those small areas uh, are, are a good place to put it. But we don't have big fields of 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 wildflowers. Um, I lived in Texas for a while and, and used to go out sometimes to see the, the huge fields of, of wildflowers, the yellow rose in Texas and things. We don't have any of that here. Okay, and Brenda is asking, how is the red wolf population doing? What human resistance do you have to their presence? And are there any inbreeding with coyotes? Uh, yes, there is a lot of inbreeding with coyotes. In, in fact, that's one of the major problems uh, to the population because once they inbreed, they're not really considered, they're considered a hybrid. They're not considered a red wolf anymore. So there's a lot of those out there uh, because there is a lot of inbreed, inbreeding with them. Um, the, the numbers have been dwindling because of uh, the inbreeding um, and the predation. Uh, a lot of people don't like the coyotes. Uh, they feel that they are um, a nuisance species, so they do a lot of hunting uh, of the coyotes. And unfortunately, they mistake the coyote, the red wolves for the coyotes. So a lot of them um, have have been killed that way. Uh, and it's it's purely by accident. And then uh, other, other times, it, a, a lot of them get hit by cars. Uh, we, we have not a lot of roads. But the roads we do have, people go very fast and they're fairly busy, especially in the summertime. So uh, the wolves will get hit by cars. So we're working to reestablish uh, what we do have. We don't have a certain number uh, because the, the refuge is quite large, even though we tag 
most of our red wolves that we find, we, we give them collars. Uh, sometimes they don't work or sometimes we're, it's hard to find them. So um, we don't have a solid number on our red wolf population, but we are working to uh, get it back up to some of the numbers that we had several years ago. Okay, and Clark is asking, is the bombing range activity consistent or during a specific, uh, sorry, specific time period? Uh, and does this activity endanger wildlife? It, it, it is, there's no rhyme or reason to it. It's whenever the Navy or the Air Force wants to come out and practice. Um, you can call them, I suppose, and get a schedule of, uh, you know, and it would have to just be like a day or two at, at, ahead of time. You couldn't call like now and get a schedule for June. That's just not available. Um, does it affect the wildlife? I suppose it does because it scares me when they go over and they're only 200 feet above us, but it's not constant. It's, uh, I mean, they may come out there, they may be active for, you know, a couple hours and then they may not come out again for, you know, another four or five days, maybe two weeks. It's very sporadic, um, but, it's it's enough so that if you hear them and you can hear the jets, they'll be flying overhead. Um, just just be aware that they can come flying right over your head and uh, and give you a good scare. But it's not it's not constant. It's not like a regular airfield where there's constantly jets flying overhead. It is it is very sporadic, but there is no rhyme or reason to it either. Um, and. Rosemary is asking if you know if there's the approximate population of alligators in the refuge. You know, we really don't. Um, so much of the uh, the refuge is inaccessible. Uh, we don't get back in there. We don't have people going and checking numbers. Even some of the the larger creeks that are, uh, you know, you can get in there with kayaks and things like that. We don't get in there. Um, so we don't have a number of the uh, population on the on the refuge. Uh, I have heard, and this is totally anecdotal uh, evidence of hearsay, but um, some of the places that are really in kind of the back or less traveled areas that there are a lot of alligators back there. Um, and by a lot, I don't know if that means they saw 10 alligators at one time or if they saw a hundred, I don't know what that means, but people have said that there's a lot of alligators back there, but some of those areas are fairly inaccessible. You would have to paddle several, several miles, as many as five or 10 miles just to get there um, and then get back, uh, do the same. So um, people don't get back there very often. So we don't know, we don't have a number of the alligators that we have on Alligator River. Okay, and they're still coming, Stephen. Um, and along the lines of the bombing range, um, Mark wants to know, are the military flyovers restricted or limited during the bird migration times uh, so they don't interfere with migrating birds? I haven't seen that many in the winter time, so maybe there is a restriction. I don't know that we actually have that because most migrating birds don't fly uh, as high as the jets, um, but some of the jets do do fly pretty low. So there might be the occasional uh, interference between the two, but uh, I doubt the the jets want to fly low enough because some of the migratory birds um, are very large. And uh, you may have heard of uh, bird strikes on a jet. It is it can be catastrophic. So I think the the jets usually in the winter time fly higher. Uh, and there, I, I have noticed that there is less activity in the winter time. So I don't know that there's actual restrictions in place, uh, but there does seem to be less activity. Okay, it looks like David Williams had his hand uh, raised, so there. Did it disappear? Okay, never mind. And we'll go to Clark's question in the chat. Um, uh, what is the estimated red wolf population, and how does it compare to the previous population? Uh, again, we don't have exact numbers. Um, 
I've, I've heard and I am not a person in the know. Again, this is this is um, uh, just just kind of hearsay. It, it can be as, as few as as 15. It might be as many as 25. Um, I don't know. I don't know the exact number um, there. There was reports that several years ago, as many as 10, 10 years ago, that there could have been 80 to 100 red wolves. Um, and that's what that's our goal is to get back to that that type of population with with several groups of red wolves. Uh, yeah, I'll just I'll just interject just because um, I have like I guess like more of the the, the definite numbers, but uh, Clark, but it looks like it looks like we have about eight collared individuals, and we're thinking that there's anywhere between. Uh, uh, 15 to 20 uncollared individuals within the wild that we're estimating um, and the highest that the population had ever been in the wild that we had known of was somewhere in the 120. Um, so it's it's uh, <laughs> it's definitely a goal to get that population back up. Um, and then the next question is from Tracy and if a person wanted to visit the refuge are there any campgrounds nearby? There are some campgrounds. Um, they're out on the Outer Banks. Um, I don't know that there's any uh, campgrounds right around the refuge. I'm, I'm sure there there probably is. Um, there's a state park over by Pocosin Lakes where you can camp. Um, I don't know of any offhand, no. I know, like I said, I know there's some campgrounds out at the Outer Banks uh, and then going to the west of Alligator River, there's a couple state parks there that have some camping facilities, but um, right in the immediate area of uh, Alligator River, I don't know that there is any. There may be some to the south going towards Madame Mesquite. There may be some campgrounds down there also. I know there's some there's, uh, a lot of hunting camps, which may be campgrounds uh, that have camping available that you could use. Um, and Bill is asking, are there any invasive species on the horizon that may present a problem in the future? Um, there's um, some invasive species. Uh, in fact, uh, we have a, a trouble with plants, uh, mostly. We, we have to eradicate several plants. We, we do burns. We use certain pesticides on plants. So um, plant Invasive species is actually our biggest problem that we have right now. Uh, I spent uh, the spring, we were in a farmer's rice field and you'll have to forgive me, I don't know the exact name of the species, but uh, we actually just walked through the field and pulled up as many of these plants as we could to help eradicate and, um, and keep that species down from the farmer's field. Um, so, uh, kind of a low tech solution to a problem, but it was uh, it was it was somewhat effective. And uh, but yeah, plants plants is the the biggest problem we have as an invasive species right now. Um, okay, and it looks like Tara dropped the link to uh, the Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, FWS webpage. Um, if you need any, if there's anyone that needs more information about planning their visit, um, and are there any more questions? Uh, if not, um, you're more than welcome to contact me uh, through the constant contact or or uh, through the email that we sent out previously, um, and I can go ahead and filter questions. But with that, Stephen, thank you so much for talking about Alligator River today. We really appreciate it. Thank you for uh, having me. <laughs> and thank you everyone for coming to the Winter in the Refuge seminar series. We have one more and it's next week on Pea Island National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, so I hope everyone has a wonderful evening.